Fabiano Caruana against Hans Niemann. There's a tasty pairing from round two of the FIDE Grand Swiss tournament taking place on the Isle of Man. So this is a, just a superb tournament. Um, it's an 11 round Swiss and the top two prizes is what, are what everyone is going for. Top two players in the tournament will qualify for the candidates tournament. That's the eight player tournaments that will decide the next challenger for the world title. So there is enormous competition, of course, but there's lots of other interesting stuff going on. Um, Fabiana Caruana, currently rated number two in the world. And after the US Championship, you know, his rating is going up. He's getting a closer to Magnus Carlsen, whose classical rating is dropping. So that's, that's one to keep an eye on. Anyway, let's have a look at this game. Fabiano Caruana, fresh from his victory in the US Championship, very convincing win. And he's playing Hans Niemann, who would very much like to grab any crown going, basically. So uh, it's a Spanish, and Niemann plays the Berlin. Now, of course, it's it's a very solid opening for Black, but given that uh, <coughs> Caruana wants to play for a win, then, you know, this is a good option because in order to go for a win, then often White has to rock the boat somehow. So Caruana doesn't go for the Berlin endgame, but keeps more tension with D3. I think that's a, a, a good choice if you want to kind of maintain the tension. <clears throat> Bishop c5, that's the normal move. Bishop is actively placed. Bishop takes c6. So giving up that light squared bishop means that, well, the idea is that it slightly damages black's pawn structure. Uh, the normal moves here are castles or knight d2. You can also play knight c3. Um, but Caruana plays h3 here. Now, I have been <coughs> known to say that there is a special place in hell for players that play these little pawn moves at the side of the board. So why is Caruana playing this? Why is Caruana, number two in the world, playing this move, which we all know is uh, perhaps you know, not advisable in the opening. Well, here it's a little bit different. The strongest players know when you can break the rules. So why is this different? Well, the reason that I often criticize this kind of move is that it wastes a lot of time in the opening and that it's better to you know plunge plunge into um, the, the the attack straight away. Uh, just bring your pieces out as quickly as possible, basically. But here the position is quite closed so that white can get away with these slower moves. And later on, it's even possible to expand with g4. Um, it, I mean, in playing h3, of course, it prevents the bishop coming out here. Not that that's a particular threat, but it can be useful. Um, it also stops a knight coming to g4, which can be important if a bishop comes here. Let me show you some of the ideas behind this move. Now, Caruana has played in exactly this way before. So I should mention in this game, Niemann played knight to d7. But, well, there's a game between Caruana and Nakamura that previously went after h3. Castles, knight to d3. Okay, rook e8, bishop e3, all very normal. Notice that white is hanging with the king in the center. So you're not committed to casting king side. You could, after the queen moves, castle queen side and launch an assault on the king side. Now black keeps the two bishops, that's sound. A4, expanding on the queen side. Castles in this case. Knight d2, we're gonna see something very similar from Caruana against Niemann. 
Now watch this, knight e2. Caruana switches to the king side. And now goes for g4 and knight g3. So this is very typical of this whole line that you can see white has a solid center, a solid pawn chain. That gives white security in the center. And that allows white to expand on the king side with g4 and claim some territory. And then, you know, maybe you can play the king up, a rook to g1, throw the knight in on f5. And white has quite a dangerous initiative on the king side. So you can see this is one potential idea behind playing with h3 on the sixth move. Well, Niemann thought for just over six and a half minutes in this position. So, yeah, it's not absolutely standard h3, although, as mentioned, Caruana has played like this before. So he, Niemann played the knight back to d7, very standard. He's protecting that pawn, but more than that, the knight often spins round to f8 and then out to g6 or even e6 as well. Knight c3, castles kingside, bishop e3, yep, that's pretty standard. I mean, if black were to exchange, then now there's only one bishop for white to deal with, that's good. And you never know, white could certainly contemplate playing with queen e2 and castles queenside here. And then you can launch the g-pawn with a clear conscience. So after bishop e3, the bishop came back to d6. Yeah, it's best to try and preserve those two bishops. And Caruana went to kingside. You could also go for king, queenside casting, but kingside, fine. Rook e8, very standard. That makes room for the knight to come to f8. And Caruana has had this position before and played a4. This time he played knight d2. So, well, we saw this just now in his game against Nakamura. And knight f8 by Niemann. So this is absolutely normal strategy. The knight wants to come around to g6. It's certainly actively placed there, looking at f4 and, and h4. It could also come to e6 to look at the outposts there. And I have to say, it's quite tempting to play f4 in this position. Because that improves white structure. You can see it's white that has a greater number of center pawns. But black is quite solid there as well. But instead, Caramwana goes for knight c4, just keeping an eye on that bishop here. Knight g6 from Niemann. Yep, looks good. The knight is looking at the outpost here. And d4 by Caruana. He thought for nine minutes over that move. Previously, he played a4 in that position. But d4, so he's breaking in the middle. Um, not, not an easy decision for black here. You, I'm sure that Niemann was tempted by the move queen h4 feels very natural to put the queen there when you know there's a pawn on h3 which is something of a target but in fact it's not quite as clear as one would wish because after this exchange on e5 and then on d6 I've got to watch out for this sacrifice so f4 and actually white is doing all right there So after d4, Niemann, after some thought, over 12 minutes, played bishop e6, which forces white to, to make a decision with the knight. And Caruana exchanges off that bishop on d6. Another big moment for white. This is such a typical pawn structure in e4, e5 openings, whether it's the Piano or the Spanish or well, many other openings. Uh, give rise to this pawn structure. And white has a decision to make. Do you do you simply hold this pawn here? You know, for example, you know, go queen d2. But in that case, well, again, you have to watch out for black throwing the queen up to h4. Do you exchange? Well, that 
looks a bit flat. Somehow hard to imagine that white is going to get any significant advantage there. Not with this knight very poorly placed on c3 when there's that pawn on c6. What about f4? I know that uh, many players like to throw that f pawn forward. It looks very nice. But actually, this would be a strategic mistake. Because in this position, in fact, white really doesn't have any kingside attack. I know these look threatening, but they're just blunted by that pawn on f6. And then things turn around completely. With that bishop on g6, the rook on e8, you can see this pressure on the pawn on e4. This queen could spin out here to hassle the pawns here. You could also double on the e-file. In fact, I think black has a very nice position there. And f4 merely weakens white's position. In the long term, it also weakens the king. But these pawns actually come under fire. So how should white play this position? It's not, not easy. Caruana played d5. Definitely the best move, considering those alternatives. An exchange of pawns. Now, structurally, you don't want to play pawn takes pawn. This is very well known from Sicilian positions, actually, where black has this potent four against three kingside pawn majority. You can start advancing the f-pawn. Also on the queen side, you know, there's going to be pressure here as well. So knight takes, of course, that's the idea. And it's, it's very interesting that now we've got a pawn structure that typically arises from a Sicilian. If you play the Sicilian Nidor for the Kalashnikov or the Sveshnikov, then you'll understand this structure very well. This is very familiar with this so-called backward d-pawn and white occupying the d5 square with the knight. I mean, I've played these kind of positions with black and white, mainly with black, you know, my whole chess career. Um, and I feel very comfortable with these positions. And in this position, this feels like it should be absolutely fine for black because that bishop just keeps an eye on the d5 square. The knight is quite actively placed. And here, what feels very natural to me is to play a rook to the c file. Because you can start to entertain the, poss the, 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 the possibility of exchanging on d5. Because if queen takes, then the rook can take the pawn. And again, if white is forced to recapture with the e-pawn, then structurally black is doing very well. So I like rook c8. Um, and yeah, let's say c3, the queen can fly out to h4. This feels quite nice. Niemann thought for a long time here and played queen d7. Also looks really solid. Also looks at potentially a sacrifice here. Queen d3. Now, the sacrifice isn't working, but of course, one would have to examine this very, very carefully. Um, the problem is that, in fact, the bishop can just drop back to one of these squares and the queen comes over to defend. But I quite like f5 here. Now, you should always be very wary of advancing your f-pawn because it can weaken the king. But with the bishop on d5, on excuse me, on e6, covering the king, that's not a problem. Um, and it feels right to, to put a bit of pressure here. You could maybe follow up with queen f7 with a bit more pressure here. But Niemann went for quite a dry move. I think unusually for him, actually, he was playing in quite a conservative manner. Now, we know that pawn takes bishop is a mistake because of f5, but queen takes, of course. But here's Niemann's idea. He wanted to break out straight away. So knight e7 and d5. Now, in the Kalashnikov, I call this the liberation station all aboard. Black wants to liberate his position with d5. And very often, this move d5, exchanging off these pawns, can give black quite a nice kingside majority. We've got, we've got this 4-3 majority on the kingside again that can push black white, uh, push back white pieces. Here it's a little bit different. 
because after the exchange, in fact, white has some nice pressure on the d file. And this bishop is a really strong piece. This bishop is certainly a better minor piece than that knight. It's so looking at that a pawn. For example, now Niemann play, actually played rook d8 here, but let's just have a look at what would happen if, if black exchanged. The problem for black is that it's not possible to challenge on the d file because of this. White simply wins a pawn. So you can see that black is already struggling to meet the rook coming down here. Now, Niemann, of course, didn't play like that. He played rook d8, which looks much more sound. And he probably thought he was equalising here. But after queen e2, matters are not so clear. The queen is attacked, queen a5. And queen g4, that's quite a nice probing move with perhaps the idea of bishop g5. And even if, let, let's say, queen c7 then white can just exchange everything. Okay, b6 is going to be necessary at some point. And c4, and this is actually quite a nice queenside majority um, with the queen on the open file as well. Now, black could have chances to hold this position, but you know, white is definitely doing well here. That's a strong piece on e3. But Niemann played queen a6, and that's not a good option. Watch what happens now. Exchange on d8 and rook d1. And I think the queen is just a bit out of play here. So, for example, after the exchange, the mate threatened, queen d7. I think the, the absence of black's queen makes itself felt there. You know, this queen is, is coming down. It's very nasty. And, yeah, what else? Again, if, if black tries to hold here, you can exchange and grab that pawn on a7. This is a constant problem around this point. So Niemann played rook a8. Now, that's not desirable to push the rook into the corner. And you can see that white has complete control over the d-file. So rook d7 hits that knight. I mean, rook on the seventh looks fantastic. Knight g6, queen f3, hits f7, hits b7. Queen a2 defends f7, b3 cuts out the queen. Another threat here. Well, if the rook defends like this, then bishop c5 hits the rook, and then you take here. So knight h8, now that is miserable, defending this pawn. Queen takes b7, so material is even again, but you can see the strength of white's pieces all looking good, and black's pieces literally in <laughs> separate corners of the board. Um, I mean, the contrast is quite striking there. I mean, this is a winning position for white. Rook is attacked. Rook e8. Now, a nice move. Queen c6. There's a very nice variation here. This is a really subtle move. I mean, not only does it defend that pawn, but of course it creates threats here. So watch this. If a6, okay, supposing black wants to hold that pawn, rook c7, attacking the rook. And that rook has run out of squares on the back rank. Obviously it can't move forward because there's a back rank mate. Okay, let's give a random check doesn't help. If rook d8, then rook c8. That's going to force a checkmate. And if rook f8, just attack it. You can see, you know, this is this is hopeless actually. So let's go back. So after queen c6, very subtle move, very nasty for black. Niemann played h6. Obviously he's got problems on the back rack. Rook takes pawn, a check, king up. King is completely safe on h2. Now, absolutely nothing that black can do about that. Rook is attacked, rook f8. Okay, let's take stock. White is a pawn up. Piece is still really active. And there are two 
connected past pawns on the queen side. It's a winning position for white, but you've still got to finish things off. I was dipping in and out of this game, watching it live, and I tuned in at this point and was thinking, OK, how do we finish off here? And I had a good, good hard stare at this position. Um, Caruana thought for nine minutes here. You know, there are several good moves. But I, I think Caruana maybe was thinking about his game, his last round game against, uh, it was against Abhimanyu Mishra from the US Championship, where, was it the last round? I'm getting really confused. I think it was the last round. Where he achieved a winning position and, and then faltered, made a couple of inaccurate moves and let his opponent back into the game. And yeah, he used these nine minutes very well and came up with an excellent move. Um, and this was actually no false modesty here. This is the move that I was wanted to play in this position too. Queen c4. Now, this is really clever. First, it supports this b-pawn in running down the board. So b4, b5, b6 is, is a threat. That's one thing. It also keeps an eye on that f7 pawn, which means that, well, one of these pieces might emerge, but not both. So that really contains black's counterplay. It also prevents that pawn from advancing for the moment. I mean, not that, that would be a particular threat, but just in case, you know, it stops that pawn advancing as well, just because of the pin. So that really squashes black's counterplay. So if knight g6, for example, then bishop c5 wins immediately because the rook can't move. Niemann tried rook d8, but simply b4, and that rook cannot go to the back rank. Let's see why. Rook d1, a check here, and queen c8. So it's very unfortunate, threatening uh, the knight, and if the knight hops out, then queen g8. And of course you have to see that this check just offers nothing at all. That is beautifully solid. Really shields the king wonderfully. So after b4, Niemann played rook b8. Stopping that. Stopping b5, attacking the pawn, but then just c3. No need to rush it. This is very calm. Just protects the pawn and keeps black bottled up because that f pawn is under fire, so that knight still can't move. And it's very hard for black to make any decent move here. You know, if um, nothing happened, if, if black does nothing here, I, I mean, I guess that white can simply exchange rooks, that's one thing, and then just get going with the pawns. Rook d8 played. And here's another way through. Queen a2 from Caruana. Queen exchange, obviously winning for white, two connected past pawns. So the queen moves away, and that stops rook a8. But the pawn could advance now. b5, nothing for black to do still. King h7, b6, why not push it on again? And it's very nice that it's supported by the bishop. F5, okay, this is um, flailing really, but it's, it's too little too late. And in fact, you can see that that weakens black along the seventh rank. But there is nothing, nothing to do. Queen A4, again, that's kind of blackmailing um, his opponent with a queen exchange. Of course, black can't entertain that, so the queen moves away. And now an absolute killer of a move. Queen H4, really love that. That queen has worked so hard in this game. Threatens the rook, threatens queen, takes h6. So rook d6, defends the pawn. Queen swoops in, threatening mate. Rook g6, defends, and queen takes e5. 
That's an important pawn to take. Uh, so now it's two pawns and white continues to completely dominate the position. It's an interesting how Caruana's precise moves just prevented that knight from re-entering the game. And he kept control throughout. Um, here, Niemann resigned. If queen f1, threatening a mate, well, you can just go queen d5. Very nice move. Maintaining wonderful centralization. King is completely safe on h2. And that knight still cannot move. So not a lot can be done about the b-pawn, among other things. Great game by Fabiano Caruana. He is showing impressive form at the moment. And what's interesting, if we look at the live rating list, Caruana number two in the world, and he has crept back over 2,800. He's rated now 2,801.2 for all those pedants out there. Carlson has dropped to 2,827. He's not having a happy time uh, in classical chess at the moment, if you think about his results in Qatar. Now, there are 11 rounds in this Grand Swiss tournament. Uh, can Fabiano catch up Caruana? He would need a brilliant event in order to achieve that. But, well, let's see. He is on fantastic form at the moment. Let's see how he gets on. I'll be dipping in and out of this Grand Swiss tournament over the next um, few few days. Um, I've got a busy time, so I'm not sure I'll be able to uh, cover every round, but I will try to keep you up to date with the most notable games. Thanks for watching.